Thank you. Good afternoon. I thought, Mohana, you were mentioned that uh, I started the special program in science, in the Faculty of Science. That, that is something which I was very proud of. Give me a minute. I'll try to... So yes, it's pretty much correct that I, I guess a lot of mathematicians are quite impractical. <laughs> uh, but this is one mathematician who is actually very interested in education. And uh, although I'm not going to talk about you know, some of, uh, of our works you know, in the university, uh, something which I'm extremely proud of uh, is the special program in science. Right, uh, the peer review system, you know, the changes to the peer review system, uh, it really looks into aspects of evaluation, all right? And um, I, I'm actually more proud of being able to put in a new program uh, and to be able to reap substantial benefits from that program. So briefly, before I go into this, tell you what the special program in science is about. It was about 12 years ago, we decided to have a very focused program. And the idea is to train students to be enthused in science and to be enthused in multidisciplinary science. So we started with a small group of undergraduates in science faculty, about 40 of them, taken from various disciplines, mathematics, chemistry, biology, physics. And we told them that the criteria for you to get into this program will be really an interest to understand that science is actually multidisciplinary. And the end objective is to create, hopefully, you know, a track for you to pursue you know, higher studies in science. And we put this group of students together. We got very good mentors for them. And we told the students, now we want you to devise your own curriculum in integrated science. We want a curriculum which would see aspects of chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics coming in together. All right? You tell us who will be your preferred teachers we get the teachers for you, right? And we put in senior students, graduate students, uh, senior students in different majors, and we got them as sort of different rungs of mentors, right? The senior students come in as senior mentors. Uh, the graduate students come in as graduate mentors. And on top of the graduate mentors, we have the professors. The mentors are supposed to devise questions for the students and to take them through the materials which they have themselves proposed to learn. And so the first batch started with this topic, right? how to build a colony on the moon. How to build a colony, a human sort of, you know, you, you, you want to move human beings to the moon. And if you look at that, that is an extremely multidisciplinary topic. All right, from st studying what are the resources that are on the moon, the geology of the moon, you know, the biology, you know, what, how can you create conditions for biology to exist on the moon, travel, you know, resources, and so on and so forth. So this, the students actually string up a series of modules in which they learn the materials and they do projects. And I'll, I'd like to tell you uh, a story that uh, there's this student, a material scientist, or rather a material science major. He said that, well, he's interested in this idea, but he hates biology. And he said, we, we, we thought that he was a pretty good student. We said, why don't you come in and try for one year? And he did. He came in and tried for one year, 
Subsequently, uh, he applied to Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge admitted him to do a tripos in mathematics. If, in mathematics, that's right. He went over to Cambridge, did his tripos. He didn't do his honors degree at NUS. Uh, after he finished his tripos in mathematics, he decided to go on to astrophysics. So he continued to pursue uh, a PhD in astrophysics. Graduated uh, with a PhD in astrophysics from Cambridge. He came back to me and said that, Prof, I have been very interested in biology, so now I'm working in Sanger Institute. All right? And that's where I think he did a lot of genetics. Right? Now, of course, he's back in Singapore. He has continued to help us in the program, but he's also running his own company. We have actually, through this program of 12 years, been able to train a lot of school teachers, all right? a lot of PhDs who are now spread over, some not in Singapore, some are in Singapore. And we find that you know, this has been a very successful program in training the multidisciplinary type of scientists that we envisage the program to train. OK, so that's a uh, digression. <laughs> let, let me uh, come back to this sort of uh, conference topic or this lecture, which uh, I have prepared for you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about globalization and how universities have been responding to globalization and to share with you some of the strategies taken by NUS. I think these are simple facts which I'm sure all of you would agree that globalization is now no longer an option, right? it's a must. And because of many advanced uh, many advances in technology, this has sort of accelerated the speed you know, and the extent of globalization. And for us to do well, we have to be plugged into this system. That would also mean that uh, the role of education would have to change all right, to blend with this trend. Now, especially with regards to Singapore. Singapore, as you are aware, has no resources at all. all right? No natural resources. The only resource that we have is really human resource. Right? And we focus a lot on how to enhance this particular aspect. And everyone has been talking about the knowledge economy, uh, where creation of knowledge is extremely important. But in the creation of knowledge, if you trace down, the essence is really human capital. Again, right? you really need very top level uh, 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 humans to generate all this knowledge. And this is not enough. You find that uh, because of globalization, the type of human capital that you have to produce would have to... Uh, have this extra dimension, all right, or have this extra global dimension. And by that, a person who is trained or who is a global in a sense must be able to think beyond confined boundaries, and sometimes a lot of these boundaries are created by culture, by religion, by race, and by many of these sort of uh, geographical uh, 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 features. And it is extremely important uh, that such a person or a graduate uh, to be able to contribute towards sustainability and uh, towards making the world a better place. I'd like to share with you uh, at least Singapore's experience. Uh, we have, uh, and this is with regards to uh, higher education, we have public universities. There are three of them. NUS is one of the public universities. There are two others, the National Nanyang Technological University and the Singapore Management University. And we are building a fourth one. Uh, so it has not been named yet, so I'll call it the new university. 
the second feature is that the government hopes to make Singapore into a global schoolhouse. And by that, they want Singapore to be a hub where foreign citizens would come to Singapore to pursue a higher level education. Right? Either at degree, at, at undergraduate degree, or at the master's level, and also the PhD level. And in this global schoolhouse concept, the initial phase has focused on business and engineering. Right? So you have universities like the Technical University of Munich offering, say, industrial chemistry together with NUS right, to foreign citizens. And you have the Chicago Business School offering uh, business courses right, through its branch in Singapore. You also have INSEAD, right, all the way from France, setting up base in Singapore. Right. And interestingly, even you see in some cases, all right, uh, INSEAD is a good example uh, that comes to mind. When they first conceived putting INSEAD in Singapore, they thought that perhaps you know, INSEAD would be able to draw students from the region, possibly from China, all right, and fewer students from outside of Southeast Asia and China and India. The current situation, right, majority of their students come from Europe and US. Right? And if you try to rationalize why so, actually it's the reason is that the economic power has now shifted to Asia. And because INSEAD, they are doing their MBA, right? a lot of students who are pursuing this degree, they are very interested in the Asian perspective. Right? And because this is based in Singapore, the Asian perspective is at least more prominent all right, and more obvious to these students. So currently, the INSEAD campus in Singapore is more popular than the INSEAD campus in France. So notice that there's this change in dynamics, which, well, at the point of formation, that was never expected. But that gives you an indication that global trends, globalization, does affect and influence you know, the, ex, the, the educational trust uh, of institutions like us. Look at NUS. We are a public university, a state university. Our key role is to really train competent manpower for Singapore. And we train them by the dozens. You know, we admit 6,500 students every year. How do I, I certainly cannot have a one-track system for all of them, right? I want to make sure that I have a very many diversified pathways for these students so that when they come, they do have many choices and at the end of it, looking at the output, I should have different types of graduates which would make you know, our graduate, our ecosystem, our country, very, very uh, dynamic and very diverse. So I think this is always a consideration. And on top of that, besides manpower training, we also hope to have a certain uh, respectable international stature. Right? We hope to be world class. So the NUS approach, especially with regards to this particular feature on globalization uh, is to first try to offer a global cu curriculum. And I'll explain what this meant. The second thing is to enrich the learning community, all right, and to enrich it with a global dimension. All right, and that's what I meant by a global learning community. Again, I'll try to explain a little bit of that. The third sort of thrust is to form alliances, strategic alliances, 
with institutions and to leverage on them in order to offer the type of education that we want for our students. We have actually uh, an internationalization strategy, which uh, if you're interested, I can share with you later on, uh, but I guess I'll uh, move on. But first, I've been talking about globalization. I have mentioned a global university. I want to sort of pin it down since I'm a mathematician. I would usually start with definitions. So what exactly is a global university? Right? We are going beyond the tra traditional approach of globalization where you know, we just send students overseas. All right? Or you know, we have more international population within you know, the student community here. Uh, and I here I'd like to borrow from Richard Levine, who is the president of Yale. He actually gave four attributes of a global university. One attribute refers to the courses. Right? Courses must have this dimension that emphasizes on interconnectivity, that in emphasizes diversity of views from different parts of the world. Second criteria or feature would be if you look at the student community, they have to be suitably diverse. All right? And that would allow sub substantial interactions amongst the student community. So the ideal one would be a, a good spread of students from many different countries so that they carry with them different values, different cultures. The third is to really move the students out right, to a foreign country where they can have this real life exposure. Right? That one, I guess uh, everyone accepts that it's a, a useful thing to have. The fourth dimension, uh, which is actually getting more prominent these days, is to have collaborative research uh, 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 initiatives with some of these universities. So now, how does NUS do that? Well, in terms of our curriculum, uh, we already have a mechanism. All right? Before we set up a curriculum, or even when we are reviewing our curriculum, these days, because of internet, because of the availability of a lot of these materials, we actually can benchmark our curriculum with the curriculum of some of the top institutions in the world. So that is never an issue, right? But of course, the second issue is really the rigor and the intensity and how we do that. Right? I'm sure a lot of you are experts in this particular area, but I'll not dwell into that uh, because there, there are many, many ways in which we can do that, right? And just now, the example which I've mentioned, the special program in science, is one, ex one instance. Quality control, uh, our department, because they offer programs, we have a visiting committee mechanism where there will be a visiting committee appointed for each department. And this will be formed by top academics and teachers and scholars Right, from top overseas institutions, usually from three to five people in a visiting committee. And the job of the visiting committee is to look at the curriculum offered by the department, to look also at the research offered by the department, to look at the graduate programs and undergraduate of programs offered by the department, and to make very critical comments on how the department can improve. And we have built it into a sort of a key performance indicators for heads and deans. A visiting committee comes in, gives its comments. That's not the end of it. What we have done is that we want the heads to highlight certain parts which the university will track. And that will feature into the performance indicators of the deans and the heads. So that's one way in which we make sure that the views and suggestions of these international panels uh, do not go down to waste you know, after their visit. Right? We track them and we do keep the visiting committee informed of you know, our responses 
to their suggestions and our actions. All right? Sometimes it has to be carried out over two to three years. For schools, we also have a, a sort of an, an advisory committee to look at the programs offered at the school level. So again, uh, this is something which is above the departments. If you look at NUS, uh, we do have actually a very diversified spread of faculty members and students. Look at our faculty members. I wonder if you can give a guess. What do you think would be the proportion of faculty members who, are, who were born in Singapore? I have 1,600 faculty members. So these are our professors, associate professors, and assistant professors. Give a guess. What's the proportion of faculty members who were born in Singapore? 30%. Any other guesses? More than 60. Actually, the first answer was correct, about 30%. About 30% were born in Singapore. Right? More than half are only permanent residents of Singapore. They still hold their residency in another country. Right. We do not give preference to Singapore citizens. Everyone is admitted or recruited through merit. And we put a Singaporean and a foreigner under the same rigorous system in promotion and tenure. So even if you are Singaporean, if you are no good, you can't make tenure, you're out. Right. So that's, that's the, the sort of... Uh, rigor that we have within our promotion and tenure system. So we have actually a very diversified uh, staff population. And that's why you see that in the Times Higher Education ranking, we always get 100 marks for that. Right? Very few universities will be able to beat that. In terms of students, right, we have 20% of our undergraduate population from foreign countries. And there are actually many reasons why we want that. It's actually a deliberate, it's a very de deliberate policy by the government. First, foreign students are usually admitted uh, at a higher level compared with the local students. Right? So the foreign students whom we have taken are really the best of the best. To give you an, an instance, Every, uh, every 20 students who apply, 20 foreign students who apply to NUS, we take one. Local students is every two, we take one. You can see the difference. 20 versus two. Right? So we are taking in the very best of the foreign students who apply to Singapore. But of course, they come here too because we do not charge too much in terms of fees. The fees that they, have, they pay is about 50% more than a Singaporean. Right? The second, second reason is really to promote diversity within the student community. The third is to increase competition. If you have a university that only takes in local students, all right, we are always afraid that our students will become complacent. So therefore, it is deliberate that we always inject very good students into the system, right? so that we make it harder for our local students. They have to compete. And competition is something which we feel that has to be built in into our system as early as possible. Why? Because the moment they go out, they are really faced with competing, not just within Singaporeans, they actually faced with competing with all the other foreigners in a very much broad, you know, global stage. So we would rather they have the competition here at NUS, and in some sense, they are allowed to fail, right? They can suffer setbacks, 
right? So it's better for them to face the competition sooner rather than later. And the fourth reason for having more foreigners is really, well, I, I have mentioned human capital. We hope to retain some of these foreign students in Singapore to contribute to Singapore. So it's a very deliberate strategy that the government is willing to pay for these students to come to, to Singapore. And more than half of them would have scholarships where you know they don't have to pay fees, they get a monthly allowance, right? And uh, the only criteria is that they work in Singapore for three years after their graduation. So in terms of diversity of staff and students, we already have that, right? And what we hope to do is really how to make sure that our learning environment, all right, has as much of this global dimension as possible. And I, I will elaborate a little bit about that uh, as we move along. The Global Alliance part is one very important component uh, in our internationalization strategy. We are very proud of the NUS Overseas College. Uh, let me talk about that. What is this? This is one aspect uh, of experiential education. Right here, our aim is really to produce students who are keen on entrepreneurship. All right? And we want them to actually learn about this in a very dynamic environment, an vibrant env environment. So what we do is that we don't have this entrepreneurship environment in Singapore. Singapore is just too small. So we send them out. We have currently five campuses, one in Silicon Valley. Every one of you know that Silicon Valley is a very vibrant place for startups, right? especially in IT and engineering. Right? So we immerse our students in that sort of environment. Another place is uh, Bio Valley in Philadelphia. The third one well, is in Shanghai. There's another one in Stockholm. And a fifth one in Bangalore. Now, the place is important because these places are key places of entrepreneur hubs. But we also want an academic dimension. And that's where I think we partner with a university partner. So at, in, in Silicon Valley, we partner with Stanford. In Bio Valley, we partner with UPenn. And Futan in uh, Shanghai, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. What do the students do? They actually are attached to a startup company for one full year. So we take them out of the academic system at NUS, they go to a company serve as an intern for one full year. Usually these startup companies are very small, about three to five people. All right. And startup companies, we are very selective, but they love to have our students because one, they are cheap and they are good. <laughs> cheap because they don't have to pay them too much. They pay them about a thousand US dollars each, each month. They are good because, you know, it's a sort of experiential training for them. So they go in into the company, they can be the janitor, they can be the business manager, they can be the salesman, they do everything. They go through the entire spectrum you know, of training. Right? So they really get very good first-hand insights into how to start up a company and how to run a startup company. On top of that, in the evenings, Right? That's where the academic component come in. In the evenings, we make sure that they go to school. Right? It's quite a hard life for them. So if they're in Silicon Valley, they'll, they'll do four courses at Stanford. Right? Two courses in one semester and done in the evenings. This will be usually business-related courses. And at the same time, we have a professor mentor for them. And the professor mentor, his job, his job and role 
is to try to connect what the student do in the day with what the student learn in the evenings. Right. And uh, students would have to put up a report uh, and do many other things that are required of them. I think the ultimate sort of uh, end result that we get, uh, we do have some problems too. We have problems like this. Students who have come back from the program, they come to us and tell us, Sir, I don't want to continue studying anymore. I want to start up a company. <laughs> you know, so much is their enthusiasm. You know, once you put them in that sort of environment, they feel that, what's the point of studying? You know, I, I, I'd rather go and start up a company. But oftentimes, we have to tell them, get your degree first, all right? Uh, starting up a company is your fallback, in, in, in a sense. Get your degree first, then you go and start up your company. Now, we have done this program since 2001. Up to now, we have about 70 startup companies done by students who have gone through this program. And we don't, we, don't, we don't send a lot of students. In each of these venues, in the first four, we send about 20 students every year. In the last one, uh, India has not been very popular. We are able to, I mean, so far I've been able to send less than five each year. But we hope to grow the India aspect. So th this is one sort of uh, educational framework, which I would call it uh, outsourcing. Singapore and US, we don't have this entrepreneurship environment. So we outsource. So we borrow the environment. We send our students out right, to Bio Valley, to Silicon Valley. And there they get the best, and then they come back to NUS. Right. So, so this is one aspect which we are actually uh, very happy about, and uh, we are looking at refining this so that more students can benefit. Right? It is a very costly program, uh, but it is a very worthwhile program. Student exchange program, that's something which a lot of universities practice, where your students will go and spend one semester or one year in a partner university. Now, there are pros and cons in such a scheme. And that's why, as we look and study further, we find that we have to make refinements. Right? A mere exchange may not be beneficial unless the student knows what he or she would like to do. Right? And perhaps you know, there is a need to provide further guidance. For the student exchange program and the many overseas uh, exposure program, the university's target is to send 50% of our students out you know, by the time they graduate. So that's to say that every year I take in 6,500 students, I expect to have 3,200 3, of them out for some form of overseas exposure. So that's the target that we set. We are quite close to the target. Right now we are able to send about 48% overseas. So if you look at the extent of our partnership with universities, we are partners with about 280 universities, all right, uh, spread all over the world. Now, I, I was talking about the student exchange program, and we find that, you know, we can refine that even more, and that's why we came up with the idea of mutual outsourcing. And how do we do that? Basically, we'll be to work with partners on joint double degree programs. So an example, for instance, is this. I hope the words are not too small. At present, NUS has about 40 joint degrees or concurrent degree programs with about 28 universities. So take an example of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Last year, we signed the agreement to have a joint degree. So a joint degree means that a student 
would spend about half the time at NUS and half the time at UNC. Right? And at the end of three, uh, four years, uh, he or she will receive one certificate with the crest of both universities on that certificate. That's a joint degree. All right? One degree, but jointly offered by two universities. This is something which is fairly difficult for US. It took, uh, took us some time to actually work with UNC, and actually we have many years of collaboration that allow us to do that. So now, you know, our students could enjoy this joint degree, so can UNC Chapel Hill students. So they come over to NUS and we go over, over there uh, to Chapel Hill. Uh, this is an instance of uh, mutual outsourcing. And the benefit is that even though our universities are large, we cannot offer everything. All right? So there are some things which are present here which are not present at uh, UNC Chapel Hill and vice versa. By allowing our students to do a joint degree, they will be able to access all, right, all the courses and all the, the, the programs on either side. And that goes with some of the other degrees. Like if you look at our new sort of uh, partnership with New York University, if you look at US, US system, the undergraduate, uh, sorry, the law degree is a professional degree, is done at the graduate level. Singapore is different, right? Singapore, our law degree is an undergraduate degree. Right? So how, how do you actually have a partnership like that? So here now, what we have is that, well, um, the two law systems and frameworks are different in US and in Singapore. We follow the UK system. Right? And US, they have their, their, their own system. Uh, what we do is that under this partnership, our students would be able to earn two degrees, one from NYU and one from NUS. And they go from NUS to NYU. Right? And for NYU to come to NUS, what we do is that we have a master's degree to attract their JDs and to do it concurrently with our masters. And students benefit because these are two different law systems, all right? and this allows students, all right, at least the graduates, to practice in both countries, pretty much everywhere in the world. All right? So this is uh, what I meant by mutual outsourcing. Uh, there, there are also many other examples. The last example I taught that I should uh, mention since my Duke and US colleagues are here. Uh, people would tell us that uh, if you look at the president of a university, right, the more medical schools that they have, the more white hair that you have. Now, NUS is one university that has two medical schools. We have an undergraduate medical school. All right, our Yong Lulin uh, School of Medicine. All right, a few years ago, we formed a graduate medical school. And this is done in partnership with Duke University, which is one of the top places in the world to do medicine. So Duke and NUS came together all right, in a partnership to form the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. And this offers two different tracks for Singapore students, but also for Asian students. Right? So our sort of uh, target is much broader. We are not just focusing at Asian students, uh, but as Singapore students, we are actually looking at Asian students. And the Duke model is a very interesting model. And when they come over here, right, they also change you know, their way of teaching. So they have this group learning initiative, which they told me that uh, it's kind of difficult to implement it at Duke. Right? It's a new pedagogical style, right? which they, uh, a lot of them are very enthusiastic about. Uh, but they find that you know, with a new school in Singapore, they can actually start fresh. 
So they implemented the new pedagogical style in Singapore. So far, so good, right? <laughs> so far, I think uh, from what we have seen from you know, all the indicators, all right, we have already admitted the second batch of students. They are already halfway you know, through their first year. So far, so good. We have been able to get very good students. Students have been performing extremely well, right? It, I, I understand it's better than the Duke students, <laughs> uh, in some sense. Uh, but that gives you an example where, you know, when you bring in new partners, all right, they can add different dimensions, you know, to the offerings that you have. I can handle this. <laughs> and, and there are many other sort of uh, similar sort of uh, nuances to the uh, student exchange program that we put in. But uh, due to the time constraint, I'll not talk about them. Right? But this shows you that you know, we, we actually have gone through you know, ma many, many uh, quite, quite elaborate top processes to try to refine uh, our initiatives. Uh, the last topic I'll talk about is University Town. This is a new campus that we are going to build just across the highway. There's a highway that runs to the north of the university. Uh, it is a residential uh, project where we hope to put in an extra 5,000 beds. Right? And this shows some of the architectural uh, sketches uh, uh, of the university town. What we want to do is that we want to actually move beyond a residential complex. We want to inject an academic learning component into it. So we hope to run you know, this residential complex in terms of residential colleges. We are trying to copy some ideas from Oxford and Cambridge and from the Ivy Leagues, right? but uh, we are not going to totally you know, take, their, take, take their practices. So we are going to put in different dimensions. So each college would have a master, would have the residential fellows. Uh, the key thing is that students should have re ready access to faculty members and especially the residential fellows. We also want the master to drive the college in terms of an academic vision. Right? For instance, the, the college master may think about using environment as one of the focal points and he may design a lot of these academic modules along environmental issues. And the way that he structured the college, the way that he rebuilt the college, perhaps it could be a zero energy uh, uh, building, and so on and so forth. So th these are some examples uh, in which we see the college could evolve. But the key thing is really to pick a good master who can actually drive the academic agenda. The way we design the college is also that we want to design in such a way that students, professors, residential fellows, they can actually use the available space to interact and engage each other at a much deeper level. Right? So we want to bring the, the learning out of the classroom, so as to say. We want to bring the learning you know, to where they are living as well. Together with this uh, university town, right, we are going to have a research outfit 